While the night battle had raged in the Surigao Strait, to the north, Admiral Kurita's Force A, with its four remaining battleships, had passed through the San Bernardino Strait entirely unopposed. The Americans at Leyte were still assuming that Admiral Halsey had left the battleships and cruisers of Task Force 34 guarding the passage. But that plan had never been put into effect. And the ships were racing north with Halsey in pursuit of the Japanese carrier force. At 0400 on the morning of the 25th, Admiral Kincaid sent a message to Halsey asking him to confirm that Task Force 34 was on station. However, the message would not be received until 0700, and by then it would be far too late. Admiral Kurita's battleship force was steaming straight for the escort carriers of 7th Fleet. The Americans had, as yet, sent out no reconnaissance aircraft, and radar indicated nothing amiss. The escort carriers which now stood between the battleships of the Japanese Force A and the American invasion fleet at Leyte were in two groups lying off Samar, Call signs Taffy 3 and Taffy 2. Further to the south was the third group, Taffy 1, while much of the shore bombardment force was chasing the retreating Japanese after the battle in the Surigao Strait. It was an anti submarine patrol plane from Taffy 2 which first sighted the Japanese fleet only 20 miles from Taffy 3. The aircraft immediately radioed its report to the carriers. The time was 0647. Almost at the same time as the American patrol plane reported the massive Japanese force bearing down on Taffy 3, the two fleets came in sight of each other. The effect was to cause complete consternation on both sides, but it was the Japanese, with the far stronger force, who would make the mistake. Admiral Kurita ordered general attack in the middle of a routine maneuver without waiting to form a battle line. The result was chaos, with the Japanese ships rushing piecemeal towards the American carriers. On the American side, Taffy 3's commander, Rear Admiral Clifton Sprague, reacted with complete presence of mind. He at once made a course change into the wind and ordered all his planes launched. Every ship was to make smoke and the carriers were to increase speed to flank 17 and a half knots. At a range of 19 miles, the Japanese big guns opened fire. As the salvos marched closer and closer to the escort carriers, Taffy 3 broadcast in plain language a desperate appeal for help. Meantime, the only hope was to run for it and at the same time, counter-attack in the hope of at least distracting the enemy. Aircraft from Taffy 3 and nearby Taffy 2, armed with whatever was to hand, including depth charges and rockets, were already attacking furiously. It would take time before properly coordinated strikes could be mounted. But meanwhile, Taffy 3's screening force of three destroyers and four smaller escort destroyers would have to be sent against the Japanese cruisers and battleships. 
Their chances of survival were slim, but they might at least delay the enemy with torpedo attacks and confuse him with smoke. The charge by Taffy 3's destroyers and escort destroyers, launched straight at the Japanese fleet, was so determined and aggressive that the enemy was thrown into total confusion. The destroyer's torpedoes knocked out a Japanese heavy cruiser and forced the big ships into wild, evasive manoeuvres. However, in spite of the extraordinary courage of the American destroyers, at 0750, the carrier, Kalinin Bay, took the first of 14 enemy shells. White Plains was also hit. At 0810, Gambia Bay dropped out of formation, listing heavily. Hit again and again, within half an hour, she was dead in the water and sinking. By now, American bombs, torpedoes and gunfire from the carriers and destroyers had badly damaged or sunk four of the Japanese heavy cruisers, for one American carrier and three of the defending destroyers lost. The Japanese fleet was in utter disarray and Admiral Kurita had completely lost tactical control. At 0925, he ordered his ships to withdraw and regroup. To the Americans, it seemed like a miracle. For two hours, Admiral Kurita weighed up the options. The fury of the American destroyer and air attacks had led him to believe that he had engaged a far more powerful force than actually existed. He had intercepted the American pleas for help and feared reinforcements would soon arrive. He had also received a message from Luzon, warning, incorrectly, that an enemy force was approaching from the north. As for attacking Leyte, he had just heard of the disaster that had befallen Force C in the Surigao Strait, and knew that his fleet was alone. Intending to engage the non-existent enemy force to the north, Kurita ordered his ships back towards the San Bernardino Strait. Although the escort carriers of Taffy 3 had escaped destruction at the hands of Admiral Kurita's battleships and cruisers, their ordeal was not yet over. Early that morning, Taffy 1, to the south, had been hit by the first kamikaze suicide attacks of the war, damaging two carriers, and Taffy 3 was the next target. Less than two hours after the end of the battle with the Japanese fleet, the escort carrier, Kitkun Bay, was hit by a kamikaze, and another hit St. Lo, bursting through the flight deck and detonating torpedoes and bombs. Blazing from stem to stern, St. Lo went down at 11.25. Before the day was out, the total of kamikaze victims was one carrier sunk and six damaged. A handful of pilots, willing to die, had achieved more than all the big guns of Admiral Kurita's battle fleet. While 7th Fleet's escort carriers were under attack off Samar, Admiral Halsey's Task Force 38 had caught the Japanese decoy force off Cape Ngano 